Good afternoon and welcome to our fifth installment of uh, Conversations in Christian Muslim Studies, uh, which is funded and supported by the Henry Luce Foundation. Uh, today, I'm honored to be able to welcome my friend and former colleague, Dr. Bash uh, Bashir Saida, who is now a lecturer in religion and politics at the University of Sterling. Uh, Bashir is the author of a number of articles and book chapters, as well as a monograph that was published a few years ago with Cambridge University Press entitled uh, Hezbollah and the Politics of Remembrance. Uh, currently, as the title of our conversation goes, he's been engaging with debates about critical religion, genealogies of the secular, and today we're going to have a conversation about some of his current work and uh, how terms like religion were uh, invented in the modern uh, world. So thank you, Bashir, for uh, joining us all the way from Kreef in Perthshire. Well, well, thank you, Josh, for uh, inviting me and uh, thinking about me for this uh, nice little round of conversations. And uh, uh, yeah, I'm I'm very very happy to to see you again. Actually, it's been a while, and uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so very happy to have this discussion with you. Yeah, so um, if you're new to our channel, um, just to let you know, you can ask a question if you're following along either uh, on YouTube or on Facebook. In about 20, 25 minutes, we'll open it up to, to questions. You can just type in a comment and I'll be able to see that and bring it up. And Bashir has agreed that he'll answer questions uh, not only written in English, but uh, in French or in Arabic as well. So if you have a question, uh, I'll open it up to you and you can just write in the comments box and it'll bring it up, uh, especially uh, if you have a question while we're in the middle of talking, you can still an uh, ask now and I'll still be able to see, see it and bring it up later. So uh, Bashir, to start us off, um, you know, your initial PhD work um, at King's in London uh, was focused in war studies and on uh, a study and analysis of Hezbollah and the politics of remembrance. Uh, now you've shifted your work uh, to focus on uh, longer questions in the fields of the intersection of religion, politics, and critical theory. Can you talk a little bit how your scholarship had you move from uh, really a, more of a political science, social science study of modern Lebanon and Hezbollah to this broader project you're now working on? Okay, thanks, Josh. Um, yeah, I, I, I uh, my first, um, my first, uh, you know, big project was working on on Hezbollah and on generally um, the cultural production of of the party and the, the general social movement uh, behind uh, uh, behind that organization. And uh, so I looked a lot at what we would call today an intellectual history of uh you know that that social field and um and what what i realized at the time i mean with time with as gradually and i started working on this and i was uh, uh starting to to uh, to also teach in the field and everything i realized that <clears throat> in um in that topic and in that field uh terms like uh the relationship between what we call religion and politics and um, the secular and the religious and all these don't really match up uh, in different areas of the world. They, they don't seem to to really point at very the same social phenomena, the same political phenomena. Obviously, I wasn't discovering gunpowder. It was something that was there in the literature already. And uh, but I slowly by looking at this. Uh, this field, I was very much interested in what we call the sectarianization literature on the Middle East, you know, that everything, that a lot of the politics of the Middle East is linked to something we call sectarianism or sectarianization, or that the political is sectarianized and all that. So I was very more and more interested in what do we call sectarianism, what, well, how, how does it work? Uh, on the ground, and most of what's studied about this subject, I felt engaged with these categories of analysis that we say called religion and politics that seem to be inherited from 
more of a Western historic, historically situated Western tradition uh, that has its own way of working with these terms or, or, or and, 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 and has its own politics. And they don't really match up, I feel, in the, in, in, in the Middle East, or at least when we, when we've used them in that context, we ended up describing a few things very well, but also I felt left a lot of the bigger picture or some of the details behind. And one of the things that I've realized is that usually sectarianism assume a political phenomenon called, you know, like sectarianism means, uh, as opposed to, and, and, and we keep that kind of variable constant that's called religion, and that has not much to do with sectarianism. So religion is something, and then, and then the sectarian or the relationship between communities that we dub religious communities or uh, communities that have some kind of religious tradition attached to them, um, that relationship is usually something that we can study in what we call the political field. So yeah, this is this is mainly what happens. So by looking at Hezbollah and how they dealt with the sectarian issue, and their relationship with with different uh, groups in Lebanon, whether some dubbed sectarian or you know whether it's about the Muslim Christian relations in the case in that case it's Sunni Shia relation Shia whatever relation, or also relationship between just different nationalist or left and right and you know type of. Uh, categories, I felt it wasn't exactly the same. It worked slightly differently. And the engagement was, was just different. So this is this was my starting point, in a sense. So uh, with this, some of... Sorry, go sorry, ahead. With, with some of this, some of this obviously, obviously um, from the field of anthropology of secularism, anthropology of Islam, you know, Talal Assad, Saba Mahmoud, some of these figures, or are you trying to push uh, beyond that sort of discursive tradition and analysis in a new way that might apply in different ways for your project? Well, definitely the works of Talal Assad and Salah Mahmoud and others were seminal in 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 that uh, that regard. Uh, they influenced a lot how uh, I see things and how I came to understand things, especially the question of the rise of the modern state as 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 a as something that will that changed the rules of the game in a way, or that changed drastically how we think of community, uh, group relations, uh, everything about you know community life in general, and uh, and uh, definitely these works uh, set the stage, especially you know Talal Assad's work on on the formation of the secular and how you know the secular is a historical the historically situated. Uh, notion that it's still negotiated and changed over time and and actually this works very well when you look at you know countries like Lebanon Iraq and others the, when we when the, the word almani is used there it means slightly different political ethical moral social whatever battles than the ones in Europe it's it's a it's a kind of a different um uh, situation. So yes, this wor these works very much influenced me. The only thing with these works is that they engage less with that movement from the pre-modern to the modern. So what is it in the pre-modern traditions, which is what I'm way more and more interested in, uh, that we can learn from uh, that tell us something about what changed or, you know, is there, is, is, are there you know what has changed and what hasn't changed, and and how how does this tell us about how we how we think of ourselves as part of communities and and community relations? So to, to that that area probably is where I'm trying to push more and more. Yeah. So obviously, um, the modern state nation state of Lebanon uh, is often considered sectarian in its politics. You even have people saying. Uh, the the poison of of uh, sectarianism is what's causing the economic and political crises of Lebanon today. Um, are you suggesting that there was no such thing as sex or communities uh, prior to the formation of modern Lebanon, or no. or what are you no, what are you trying not. to explore? I know you're yeah. not, but I'm... <laughs> yeah, of course. No, what I'm trying to say, I mean, this is uh, of course building on works that. With like Osama Magdisi's work and others, sectarianism as a political arrangement is a modern phenomenon. It's not 
something that you know is something creeping from pre-modernity into modernity and that we have to get rid of in a sense in order for things to get better uh and you know mike this is work i think covers a lot of ground on this uh, and so there's not much that 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 be said but definitely it's a political formula that was developed in the 19th century now this in itself is a huge statement it, it there's a lot of implications to the statement and i think we still are starting to understand what that means you know uh, a lot about then how did we think of sect or group relations before that period you know there's not much done on that uh, and also because we don't have much you know we don't really have the archive i mean the archive we have are all scholarly textual archives that you probably are familiar with yourself uh, but they deal more with like doctrinary issues and things like this but we have very little of the social life or we don't, we, we we can get much less the glimpse of how these doctrinary discussions are actually embedded in a socially lived experience which probably makes makes them actually mean something else their perf performative dimension is going to be very different but the problem is that in orientalist studies or in islamic studies and arabic studies these texts are taken at face value most of the time they're kind of treated a bit ahistorically even when they say that we're treating them historically it's still they're still outstripped from their social milieu because for the simple reason that we can't really reach out to that milieu we were not there and it's it's kind of hard to find actual data for or information or archive on this um and we, we can we, we can come to this I'll, i can give very specific examples if you want at some point in the discussion but yeah the idea was to think okay how was sect or the notion of sect which obviously again is an english term that does not exist in, in arabic but what comes come close to us is ta'ifa uh, or milla or other these are the texts we see in the in, in the early text in in earlier texts let's say uh, how how what do these terms meant and how were community relations obviously this is what interests us how then were community relations any different or any similar to the kind of community relations we have today what has really changed uh and i think a lot has changed and uh and we can yeah we can talk we can talk about how that 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 happens so in in the proposed uh discussion you're going to look at how these terms like milla dean uh both map on but also in their pre-modern use are distinct and different than how we understand things like sect or religion or community um what periods are you looking at how are you going about exploring those those words why you know i think uh taifa you could also add the word sharia a personal issue of interests of mine where in the pre-modern period you have things like shreit al-masahi uh, Shreed al Injil, you know, words that are used quite normally by Muslims and Christians and Jews, Zoroastrians of one another. So the term Sharia wasn't an Islamic term in, in the classical uh, period. So, how 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 can can you explain a little bit about how you think this category of religion and sect uh, was invented or constructed? Okay, I mean, so not to get too scholarly and too, you know. Uh um technical about this you know there's a field in in religious one called religious study that tries to question this notion that tries to actually engage at least critically with the notion of religion as we use it today like where does it come from what, is it something that has always been there is it something that has been historically constructed over time uh, and how does this have any bearing on our discussions why is this important and what does actually more importantly what does this tell us about how we study the texts like the earlier text yeah. and you know and this and 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 one thing is sure is that the, the category of religion as a category of analysis that we use in our in our scholarly work uh is definitely a modern conception at least has a lot of the bearing of a modern conception uh that has that is mostly inherited from you know the usual culprit the protestant uh con <laughs> conception of uh, uh, a, a Protestant conception of what religion should be. So, in basically, a bunch of beliefs, doctrine, doc, doctrines, practices, all this like a package deal that people can, you know, can can endorse and 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 do something with it. 
Whereas until now, if you look at religion, when we put it in the Middle East and stuff, well, it's way more than this. It's territory, it's population, it's history, it's, it's I'm from this village, uh, you know, uh, I eat this way. I don't know, you know, there's, there's all sorts of things that come in that are neither written nor practiced or or believed or anything sometimes you have people who are christian but would never set foot in a church but still you know think of themselves so you know you know all, all the stuff and so one of the things is that works super well in the west because the way the political system works in the west is that you have these different groups called religion religions you have uh, and people allocated to these groups or outside these groups, and they're the secular, whatever citizens, uh, and and that kind of frame works very well in the West. As in the, in other places in the non-Western world, until now, you you have a hip, uh, some kind of a hybrid system where you have a bit of these categories pushing themselves in, but then you also have other things in place, uh, inst institutions of the church or. Uh, Islamic institution, others work slightly differently. They have different influence prerogatives. They do stuff. They affect life differently. They, you know, different sources. Of it. Um, so, so yeah, this is a way of understanding things critically. I would say is to engage with these differences and to try to understand where do they come from and how do they change over time. And that that so with regards to the title, I feel like I've talked too much again. <laughs> but with regards to the title, this. This has a bearing on how we use these terms. So, for example, the, the terms that I propose. For example, the term deen, which is commonly translated as religion, which obviously could be translated. Uh, I mean, it works. It's not, it's not that, uh, that it doesn't. Uh, for my, from my understanding of things, was very rarely used in the plural form in the pre-modern text. I found very, very few instances. I think it's very it's very interesting that it is not that that much it's very rare and when it's used usually it's in very specific books that some of them are in Persian actually but if you look at the classic sources of the 10th century 9th century etc and 11th century I mean until now I haven't found anything really noteworthy where you have a discussion of the rulers sense of them. this gave you know it, it made me think okay why why is that so what's happening here when 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 the ancients wanted to talk about different groups they talked about milla in general okay so they so so uh and even the term ta'ifa is not is not that much used uh i feel like ta'ifa emerges more in the ottoman period and it seems to be more of a professional category for example ta'ifa was for crafts so if you, you know like the it's like a syndicate or a labor union of some sort it's, it's, you know so it, it it has what we call today a secular, you know, this is what we would call today secular imprint, you know? So it's, it doesn't have to specifically do with, uh, but it has to do with some kind of state administrative category in order to, you know, control uh, some kind of population, community in place. Uh, it's only in the 19th century, I think, or anti I mean, there's the works of Bruce Masters that shows this very well, that the... the the system of uh, milla as ta'ifa crystallizes in the modern, in the pre, like the pre-modern period that is really close to the modern period, rather than something that has always been there. Uh, and I think this has to do more because of the fact that the Ottoman was becoming more of a, you know, trying to solidify itself as a modern state, tried to emulate the Europeans, and trying to, you know, organize. Uh, a centralized and organized population in different categories and all that. Um, so yeah, um, so yeah, this was so. Sorry, what? What were? So I want to. Yeah, yeah. I want to tell you after about how this has a bearing on, on community relations. But yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, I mean, so of course, um, Islam emerges in a religiously plural context, and if you're talking about the you know Umayyads or the Abbasids are ruling uh religiously plural communities let just you scare quotes religious right and the texts that are being produced um the ones that i'm most familiar with whether these are kalam philosopher um fiqh, do recognize the existence of these other um communities and they debate their merits their truth their 
you know, sometimes this is what they're arguing about. Other times they're making rulings about, uh, you know, should Zoroastrians be allowed to do X, Y, and Z if they're not, mm -hmm. you know, are they a halal kitab, are they not? Um, why is that not, a, why is that not religious? Why is, what, what is really the, di I mean, I, I do think there's a distinction, um, but I, I think just to yeah. tease out a little bit more no, for people who are do, listening. And do, and do become, and do be more incisive if you can, because I think there is a noteworthy difference here because I feel that in the 19th century, it was this notion of world religion that emerges. You have some kind of an ontological difference that emerges between something called Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Buddhism, whatever, you know, whatever came classified as something. And that and that has a at the identity level a big a significant difference on community relations. So, uh, in the case of I think pre-modern texts, I feel like pre-moderns were much less. Uh, I think they were much less bothered with the fact that different traditions belong to different group with their own practices and all this. But they were all part of the same tradition. I feel it, there was a, some kind of an englobing tradition, which is which is just the tradition of community life. And let's call it this way. I don't have another term to do it, but you know, a certain quality of life. And this certain quality of life had different teachers and lineages. And these teachers and, and lineages of teachers were the, the different millas. Because milla means basically going back to a teacher. It comes back ala milla somebody. So, so basically ala milla Ibrahim in the case of Islamic tradition. But, but ala milla Ibrahim is the same for the Jews and uh, uh, to a certain extent, at least for all the all the traditions. So my point is that I feel like in pre-modern traditions, at least at the level of how these things were imagined, there was much more of an englobing, if you want. Uh, there wasn't this, this separation. There was more of a separation, I feel, over... Uh, 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 relationships of okay, how are we going to deal with this practical matter or this? Okay, you guys want to live it this way, you guys live in a different way, or they had the, these practical differences rather than these kind of bigger ontological differences. Why I think so? Because I think that in the secular realm, because you have that category that is outside religion, outside this thing called religion, called the secular, then you have these religions that are juxtaposed next to it. But when you don't have secular, you don't even actually have religion in the first place. You just have community life and and God or a God God Godful universe, a God led universe of some sort that has has never really been, at least not significantly, put into question, which everybody kind of followed. And I mean, the consequences of this, I think, the consequences of this is that the environment was much less. So when religion has become defined in a more of a you know kind of package deal of things that are lodged into the state, religion has become much more curtailed to say moral uh, self transformation, whatever type of prerogative, rather than you know life in general connected to so many other things that today we would call secular. So it kind of pushed religion in an extreme. And then also that's this kind of identity closet. I don't know if I make myself uh, clear. I mean, some of, some of the differences are the kind of texts and questions that we read as um, someone more theologically oriented like myself. And so a lot of the pre-modern texts, say, coming out of Arabic, uh, whether those are written by Christians or Muslims or Jews, are about disagreement, right? The, I mean, to use like various classical ones, Ibn Hazm making this argument that Christians and uh, Jews have corrupted their scripture, Ibn Tamiya, he does use the word, at least at the end, al din al So he, it's a qualifying, it's not a plural, you're right, right? But it is the, the religion of the Christians that he's critical of. Uh, you have um, often, uh, accusations by Sunnis, especially Asharis, that uh, it, that Shias are too close to being Christian, right? 
so I do think that the borders are blurry. It's just how do we make sense of these this history of polemics? Um, and that might just be like you were saying, we don't have access to the social world. Uh, what we do have access to, or at least some access to, are these polemical texts or these philosophical texts. But you know, it's certainly I. I I'm with you on a lot of things. It's just how do we make sense of this? No, I don't. Yeah. Think, I don't think it's. I. I do think you're right in saying, it's not. Um, that debate doesn't operate in a in the same ways that they operate post say 19th century, where there's this thing called religion that is a separate category, and each of these things are, um, you know, uh, gene. You know examples of the same core essence that certainly is not the case um yeah okay so first thing pertaining to the, the debates and the polemics happening where you are way more of an expert at this than me i have i haven't looked at all the debates yet and i'm still starting on this my problem my you know my my intuition and i'm not sure yet is that if you're focusing on writerly debates you want to think of it, who, who is writing, why, what is the, the social function of this writing? And, you know, yeah, what does it do in reality? So, for example, this kind of debate and how they talk about the difference between Jews, Christians, and Muslims at the time, does it have the same performance that it has today, say, if there is a debate of such sort? And so, the, already noting the difference between, between the universe in which such debates happen may lead you to some kind of you know uh, interesting you know uh, point or difference because you know how today we talk about dialogue of religions or the dialogue yeah. of cultures you know that concept wouldn't i wouldn't think would make sense at the time if, why because i think at the, you know in, in earlier times or before the rise of the state which categorized these groups as fundamentally different uh, you, you, because before the rise of that, you, you you didn't have these fundamental differences. I still think, like, okay, what you said about the text about the Jews have corrupt and the Jew Christians have corrupted their teaching. This is also in the Quran. I mean, it's it's already there in the Quranic tradition, and and the Christians have their own kind of texts about where the Jews went wrong and etc. And the Jews have us. It, it's kind of built into the tradition. But I think these things are built into the tradition. In order to delimit communities, this is the thing. So they're there for that purpose of saying this is where Judaism stops, or this is where being Jewish stops, and this is where Christian begins. It's a bit, for me, it resembles a bit a modern border, a modern national national border. You have to draw a border so that you know where the state sovereignty ends. Okay, I mean the border is artificial, really, but it's still it's artificial. As, as uh, it's not always like a narrow border, but you have to have this, or else you'll have people shifting back and forth. It wouldn't make sense to be Jewish or Christian or Muslim. You would just go back and forth with these different things. And when this, the, the, the tradition has these these boundaries, and then you, you I know it, it sounds a bit like a theater of some sort, you know? So the, you know, the Muslims have to have a narrative about why you should be Muslim and not Jewish and Christians, and the Christians have to have, et cetera, et cetera. But these things are kind of understood as being there to to delimit these boundaries. Uh, more of a, I feel like I feel like the ancients were more more flexible about these things, more fluid about understanding this this theatrical nature of these things rather than take them to heart. And one of the one of the things that I notice is that in the West, if you see the community relations between Christians, Muslims, etc., there's way more a gap between. These, these relations, like if somebody is Muslim or somebody is Christian, or at least identifies as that, the, 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 the gap is like, I'm identified to a, source, a, a very different group than yours. If I'm Muslim, I'm not Christian, etc. Okay. Whereas in Lebanon and other places, there isn't, it's much, it's still much more fluid. Of course, people stay Muslim and they, they could stay, of course, people convert, but usually you, you are born into a tradition and all this. But the relationship between the treasure, the, the traditions are more fluid. There's much more, you know, my prophet is your prophet, and we're all, a, a, we we know these things are related to each other. Whereas here, it's, I feel there's much more of these delimitations. 
because of this, I think the modern state categorized these groups as different. Uh, I don't know if what do you what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think I think there's something um, obviously distinct in how religion, whatever we mean, community belonging, identity, cultural life exists, and that there's these fluid um, conceptions of this. Uh, I mean, I, I've used this story before when we were living in Ramallah in Palestine. Um, they did this sort of diversity training with all of the staff and, you know, say there's 50 people there, 47 of them are Palestinian, an American, a Dutchman, and, a, and an English woman. And they were doing things like things that you're born with or things that you chose in terms of your identity. And when it came to religion, all of the Palestinians said, oh, that's something you're born with. All of the Westerners said, this is some, something we choose. Um, exactly. And there's this, this sense, and if anyone watched the interview either last week or the week before with Sinan Antun, you know, he talked about, yeah, I'm Chaldean Iraqi. I'm, I'm not a believer anymore, but I'm still Chaldean Iraqi. Um, and at the same time, he was trying to say, when I write a novel about a Chaldean in Iraq, I'm not writing about Chaldeans. I'm, I'm writing about Iraqis. And that whatever ex experience that a Chaldean might have had during uh, Saddam's reign isn't necessarily distinct. You know, the suffering that one experiences from the occupation is 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 shared by all of us. So this this sense of belonging, I think, certainly is still latent. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how you think that's been transformed? Um, well, this is like what exact one how we're talking about this right now will tell you about uh, this transformation. We're still thinking that. You know, belonging is something, and belief is something else. Exactly. And that's a Protestant. That's a very Protestant notion. That if you don't, you know, I am Christian, but I don't believe. Yeah. In pre-modern times, this statement I think wouldn't make sense. You know, because there is wouldn't be that stress on belief. Of course, belief is important in your practices, but in terms of community relations. It's it wasn't like the most important thing. It is it's not it's not what delimits you from being from belonging to a group. It's mm -hmm. a bit like today nationalism. Like if you're yeah. French or you're German or you're Lebanese or whatever, you don't need to be to believe in the Lebanese state. And nobody asks you. Obviously, you have vows of allegiances and you you know you you hold the flag and you do all this stuff sometimes, but. You could do. I mean, I don't do it personally, but you know, some people do. <laughs> and but it doesn't mean they believe or anything. But nobody yeah. questions them about it. Nobody tries to do. And th so the problem is in this case is that we should stop thinking that we should stop. I, I, no, not we shouldn't do anything actually. But I think the fact that we make that distinction is already a good example of the the implication of the the the, crawl, the creeping effect of religion in the Western sense of the term. Yeah. And in Lebanon, you have that. In Iraq, you have that. In countries where you have these different communities, people say, uh, you know, I'm born in that community, but I don't, I'm not religious, you know, or I'm not that. It's kind of a, you know, uh, it's kind of a disclosure statement, mm -hmm. which, which, is, which, is, which is fine. But, but the point is that that doesn't mean anything in a, in a pre-modern setting. You're still part of that. Obviously, the state slowly is changing that. So the state is slowly delimiting these things differently, except that in the Middle East, uh, I mean, it, it's yet to be seen how much this change is going to happen. Or in Lebanon, you have that very hybrid kind of mutant system where you have all sorts of elements uh, coexisting uh, between some kind of, uh, you know, different kind of group identification and all this. But yes, the big evil in Lebanon is sectarianism. But sometimes, this slips into the notion that uh, you know the sectarianism is evil because you can't you know you can't trust religion. Yeah, and I feel like this kind of statement is is a bit absurd because that's the point. There's no such thing as religion to begin with as as a body of you know specific phenomena that you can point out and say okay this is religion unless you have in mind practices, beliefs, doctrines, and all this. Which, in the first place, is not what I think was the most important thing about community belonging 
before the 19th, 18th century. And I think we have something to learn about this because maybe that would mend community relations a bit more today, especially if we're talking about Muslim Christian dialogue and all these things, which I, we can. You know. Yeah. So a few people have uh, added uh, cheerleading notes to the side. So just uh, so you can see them. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Sheikh. Oh, that's Emma. It's my friend. Yeah, yeah, and uh, oh, and the uh, others compliment. Oh, thank you, thank you very much, guys. A few, okay. a few others. I don't know if this is a family relation. Yes, it seems so. <laughs> but okay. uh, but uh, Gemma Dao has a question about your use of theatrical nature and the fluid religious and tra traditional identity, which may relate to what we were just talking about in rediscovering that. Could could you clarify a bit for for her? Yeah, I think, I think she's being she's being ironic. Uh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah I, I I do want to I do stand by by this idea that we have a much more rigid way of looking at things today, much more square, squarely defined things, and squarely defined because institutions that are in place do the definition for us. Um, Ah, okay, Jima is not earning. Ah, okay, okay. Uh, so yeah, I do think that <laughs> I do think that we have this kind of uh, more rounded identitarian uh, phenomena happening, and I think this state has to. This is where Talal Assad and Salman Mahmoud, I think, are interesting. They're maybe that you know, there's been criticized on a lot of things, but I think on this point they're interesting and to show that actually the state is a big watershed in the way things work. And the state has this tendency to categorize, you know, and, and, and form things in a more rigid way than it existed before, simply because they have the power to do so, because they have the technology and it, it's just something that happens. Uh, so this, maybe yeah. that's related to what you are just saying. So Alex uh, Henley has asked about institutions, which I think yeah, also maybe- yeah, it, but it, even in the pre-modern situation, um, a lot of the debates that I that I look at, whether these are theological or fic related, assume that there's something um, like, uh, say, let's use the church and and you know that there's something like a a dean uh, al masahi or shariat al masahi, and that there's a there's a legal tradition. And an institution that can at least regulate that, and a lot of the things, you know, arguments can be made. And I think they're mostly, let's say, in Egypt, what you have happening is is the carryover of these traditions. So the Coptic Church, for instance, regulates marriage and divorce, uh, while the you know, whoever the the Sunni regulates marriage and divorce for them. Um, so institutions are now, though, as you've noted, embedded in the modern state, yeah. and they then take on a very different character than they had maybe prior to the to the rise of the state. The way that, um, say, the the papacy in in Alexandria, the, the Coptic papacy functions, has been radically transformed in the twentieth century by the rise of of modern Egypt. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know the Marianite uh, patriarch in, in in the way that I know in, in Egypt, but I could imagine something similar. And I don't know if it was you. Or another scholar actually, who came. Alex, actually, Alex has, a, has an interesting work on on the Maronite patriarchate and its and the, the institutional change there. Uh, but yeah, sorry, what were you saying? Or I was going to say, I, I remember someone telling me that they essentially created a Sunni mufti uh, in yeah. Beirut in the Alex, early, yeah. Yeah. like in the nineteenth or early twentieth century, just so they could have some. You know, that's not a. It was a twentieth century invention for the state. Not to say that there isn't traditions of muftis in the Ottoman period, but they're not the same and they're being transformed. Exactly. I mean, uh, again, Alex's work on the Sunni institutions, especially specifically the mufti institution and, uh, and, uh, and the others are, are interesting. That regard. Alex asks me about it, but I think, Alex, you're probably better than me to talk about this. I, I, I think, you know the story is is a typical story that's already in a lot of the literature. Um, 
as you say, there's level, several Sharia for the simple reason that before you had a more the legit, the legis, let's call it the legislative, or the, the way rules and regulations took place was much more under the hands of these, in, these traditions that we will call, that we call today religion. Uh, and, but they're much more than what we call religion. They're exactly. Some kind of, you know, uh, I, I think Milla, Milla is a much better term because there's a tradition. It's a form of tradition that goes, that has a lineage of knowledge transmission of some sort. So, uh, and, and, and these words, these functions had quasi state functions, but obviously not, not the capital state. They more power than what, what they have today, in a sense, on certain things. But then, for example, in the case of the Mufti uh, in Lebanon, as uh, I think Alex is thinking about, uh, and other places, sometimes more power than what they had, and then maybe also a loss of power, depending on, for example, um, the, you know, the, 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 the Mufti, uh, the Mufti's position was about issuing fatwas, but for example, I think this is what Alex works on, you know, uh, wrote about and now the mufti doesn't issue any fatwa like this was the whole point of the mufti uh the mufti position in that case so you have these big big transformation that we we should take note of but to show that these these really important institutions or you know uh positions have drastically changed and i think they have drastically changed because of our of how we think we think of these categories you know of religion and 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 politics. So to, to go back to the question of Sharia, I think, I think it's a very good example because, okay, I think before you could have people that are part of the same family, sorry, you could have same family, extended families, obviously not the nuclear family, but, you know, in pre-modern times you have more like tribal or network or clanic, whatever structures that are at the same time Muslim and Christian that exist. And that makes absolutely no sense if you plug the term religion in the modern sense of the term. Uh, you have families that are half Shia, half Christian, for example, in, in the Sham area, you know, Lebanon and Syria. Uh, and this is what I'm way more, more and more interested in. So how does this come about? Well, I think a lot of it has to do with, with the fact that there, um, We might have lost him, uh, which is an exciting. Because of uh, life. Yeah. Hello? Oh, we lost you for a minute. Can you hear me? Yeah, it, we lost you for a minute. Go ahead. I, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just saying that if we lose the, the, it, so for example, how do we explain that these structures existed? You had, you know, uh, no, for example, how do we explain, um, these are conversions or people belonging to a tradition. I think it had more to do with things that today we classify more as secular stuff. For example, you're part of that territory, you're in that village, or you move to that region, or uh, you married into something else, you know, or uh, as, as these transformation used to happen. And most of them did not happen for, you know, belief or things like this. So what the ancients were much more interested in is to how to creep these, I feel, institutions in place rather than debate about Christianity as some kind of separate religion and, you know, Islam as a separate religion. I mean, you have doctrinary issues being debated, but I think they're more, you know, they're, more uh, they're kind of a byproduct of, of a bigger discussion of, you know, that are more worldly in a way or more we would call secular today. Yeah, I mean, way. there's been because a lot of... Because at the end of the day, in terms of... Sorry? Oh, I was just going to say, there's been a lot of resurging scholarship on, on these martyrdom accounts of Christians, uh, polemical texts, and a lot of people think they're, they're not produced. They're produced to maintain the community. So they're, they're produced in some ways because Christians are converting are becoming Muslim, let's not say converting, slowly over the first few hundred years of the rise of Islam. Mm -hmm. And like you said, in large part, it's not, there's very few cases that we know of where it's because of a Muslim argument. It's because someone moves. It's because someone wants a promotion. It's because someone marries someone. 
uh, especially in yeah. places like Egypt and and what we would call greater Syria or Shams, right? Um, and so that the polemical texts are, are are not written by Christians for Muslims, but written by by Christians or by patriarchs to keep their community in the fold, to show that as you're shrinking, you have a reason to be. Um, and this is one of the one of the yeah, arguments yeah. that a lot of scholars are making. That's that's but. great, yeah. And and you can see the stark difference with conversions in Europe. Like nobody will convert in Europe because he's moving from one city to the other, <laughs> or or because he's. I mean, you have you have conversions for marriage reasons. Usually, these conversions happen because some identitarian issue in a family. So, for example, you have. I'm giving a totally stereotypical example. You know, a Pakistani family, say, or an Indian, or or say a Muslim family, and then you have some kind of Western white, whatever a person marrying into the family. You know, sometimes they convert, but they convert. Not it's, this is not the same thing. It's not the same phenomenon as somebody converting, say, in Egypt, or mm -hmm. uh, or, or or Lebanon or Syria. You know, because one is is more of an identitarian issue. I feel. And the other one has also to do with like actual legal legal structures. Of course, it can have identitarian ramifications in the case of in the case of Lebanon or Syria or others, but um, but identity again maybe there is more linked to land and territory and resources and population is it's it's a completely different uh, yeah, and the, the the example of the Copts is great. I mean, take the example of the Druze, you know. Is even as the Druze, even can can even can you call it a religion in the in the, the 19th century term? Of course, the Druze will say we are a religion. Everybody wants to fit that category now. But I'm just saying, in terms of analytical thinking, you, there's so many elements about it that 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 doesn't really. First, also the the Druze tried to push for the idea that they're part of Islam, whatever yeah. that means. Also, you know, so. My point is these things are very negotiate, negotiated until now, and we kind of take for granted there's this such a thing as religion that is separate from other walks of life, other things happening in life. And uh, yeah, so. Yeah. So I'm aware that uh, we're coming near the end of our time uh, and wanted to give people uh, a chance to ask any questions in the last five or six minutes other than me. So if you have a question uh, via Facebook or uh, YouTube, you can ask it. And Bashir has uh, agreed to answer in uh, the languages of Lebanon. So French, Arabic, and theoretically English, thanks to AUB and all of those Protestant missionaries. Um, <laughs> uh, so if anyone has a question, uh, I know we've got a few a few comments we can bring up from uh, Kareem Badra. Uh, you know, I think it's about very, very, my, my, very helpful comment. <laughs> yeah, I, I said that when I saw him anyway, e either. She, uh, so can you say a little bit more? I mean, Gemma's already asked a question, but she's got another one about faith expressions it's in true. the public field uh, and the you know religious perception from both inter inter external and political view on the one hand and in the public field and representation. I think that might be a question about about more modern uh issues or, or maybe not yeah i wish you could just reformulate what the question is exactly um i, I yeah i think i mean at about ritual uh, there's a bit of scholarship on this subject which links to this uh, notion of transformation like what has changed and how is it different um again i think our conception of the ritual is very much has has the imprint of the Protestant understanding. We've talked about this, Josh, you and me, I think, many yeah. times. No? That yeah. ritual is is about, you know, either you know, doesn't it? It can't be meaningless, or it has to reach out to some core of something we're doing for very specific reasons. And uh, whereas I think the ritualistic was very much thought as something that was part of everything we did in life. And a lot of that did not need to have either sincerity or meaning 
plugged into it at at all you know in a conscious way so sometimes we, we we did things like i tell my students for example what's the difference between brushing your teeth and praying daily okay obviously there's a big difference but in terms of the periodicity of what i'm doing and in terms of the kind of intention i put in doing these things uh and i think yeah most of most of the big difference uh, about these things is the kind of meaning that I allocate to it. But, but in those times, I do it because I have to do it, you know? So it, it, it's it's something that, that comes and goes. And I, and I feel like uh, in, in pre-modern times, there was much more of a... Everything is ritualistic. So not just I'm doing prayers, you know, chanting and doing things that are called religious, but I'm doing everything else that you know that could connect it to, that is connected to me how I live. You know, it's not separate between what I call religious and what I call secular. Um, watching a football game or you know can get as as much adrenaline in my system than than doing a nice meditation. I don't know. You know. Uh, it, 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 these things or watching a movie an inspiring movie so so all these are are things that we do ritualistically but obviously because religion has become more of an identity issue about belonging to some group um ritual expression is has become some kind of a performative um you know a, a performative expression of who i am in a larger field of people who are different from me, so I come and I and I show. Okay, I'm Muslim because I do this, 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 and I'm Christian because I do this and this and this. And so there's this outwardly kind of thing, or inwardly, if that is the outer perception that I am an inwardly person. So if I'm in, in the Protestant sense, it's more like if you are, if you want to do these things, you have to. It's all more like inward and it's at home and in the private sphere and all this. But it's the other side of the coin of. I need to do it also publicly and all this. I feel like both of these are are both sides of the same coin. I don't know. Yeah, so there, there's a sense in which the um, separation of something called ritual and something called habits, practices, yeah, um, community, etc., is part of sort of Latin Western, not just Christian. I mean, not just Protestant, also Catholic. This sort of, uh, I mean, it comes out of Greco-Roman language, right? And so then when you apply it, it becomes difficult to understand. I mean, I've been doing some stuff on, on Al-Ghazali and the Ahiya, and he talks a lot about the importance, of course, of your heart, uh, of interior, of intention, but nowhere does he suggest that, the, that you shouldn't do the exterior practices, right? Nowhere does he suggest um you know you can pray whatever you know he never pulls a protestant move and says because the reason we face mecca is to be joined to the community da 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 da, da. he doesn't then say we can go anywhere we want right wait so he, he, you so still have to a bit what did you say you still yeah. i mean for him intention is important he wants to you know ahia resuscitate religious sciences but the, you don't do that by dropping the exterior practices in a way that well, yeah, exactly. the, that the that the latter thing that it only matters if there's intention, right? And intention is obviously an important yeah. part of Islamic tradition, but um, yeah, I think there's something quite distinct there. Well, uh, I think if I, if I can, can I say something about this? I have, I think there's a way to to one way to put it. I feel I don't know if correct me if I'm wrong, is to say that in, intention is important for sure. But in, in, in the kind of Protestant or even Western, let's say, tradition, or however we're going to call it, or something emerging in the 18th, 19th century, intention is the beginning. It's, it's the cornerstone, like, like with intention, the beginning of something, whereas in the in terms, intention is the end point. It's like the cherry on top of the cake. Like if you can, if you can build that kind of, if you want, spiritual stage whatever we call it, you can maybe be gifted with a clear intention it's like yeah. you know uh, it's like belief actually belief you start in the beginning with doubt you're like plagued with doubt and then belief is kind of you know if you're lucky enough you know you get certainty or something like this no 
So it's like really if you're if you're really lucky and worship you get to there whereas in modern times it's the contrary first you you are believing oh i have become a believer and then you join the group and then you know uh, you know you're part of the group which makes no sense like because obviously belief and intention and all these things are very difficult difficult things no so why how how does this change you know why would yeah. that, how would yeah, I feel I mean, like belief is more of a profession of belief. It's like a statement of belief. And it has to do with a Western political tradition of, I think that emerged after the wars where people would say, I profess that I am part of that group. And that's a statement of belief. But that doesn't mean an actual state of belief. A statement of belief is not a, you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, again, I, I've been working on the Sassan al Ghazali. So, I mean, he says the beginning of being a Muslim, and in some sense, the only thing that's required is to say, you know, Ashahadu, I bear witness. But that's not, that doesn't necessarily equate to full belief and faith without action is, you know, he crit critiques it. And, and in similar ways that we were saying, yeah. you know, in a way that might challenge many modern Muslims, he's not saying, you have to know the whole of the madhab, all of the fiqh. You have to know what's right and wrong in order to be a member. He even says, you know, if you live in a Muslim majority culture, like a uh, food practice, you don't need to know that pig is uh, uh, haram. It's, it's irrelevant. It's only when you go to the borders and you go to, he says, a place that is yeah. always drinking and always eating pork. So, you know the UK, yeah, uh, exactly. then you need to learn this. But before then, that's not part of what it means to be a Muslim or to be belonging to this community. And also, if you look at in the Christian tradition, the notion of Trinity, okay, that's like the, you know, it's not a notion that comes about very easily. You're not born with the notion, of, okay, yeah, I get it, Trinity, sure, I'm living it. No, you need, I mean, people meditate on this for decades, Yep. to get to a certain understanding of what that means. But being a Christian involves a profession of belief that yep. you believe in the Trinity. But obviously, yep. you, I don't think that you have a clear understanding or even be real belief, real incorporated dispositional kind of belief of what that even actually means. So, yeah. Yeah, so... Um we're come to the to the end of our time. It's been a fascinating conversation. We could talk a lot more about a whole host of other things, uh, which we've uh, maybe when the lockdown eases, we'll be allowed to do. But um, just to thank Bashir uh, for joining us, and just a note of thanks as well to the Henry Luce Foundation for their support in making all of these things possible. Um, we've got a few more coming up uh, in the next few weeks. So if you want to learn more, follow us on either the Facebook. Uh, page, Twitter, or YouTube. Uh, and if you have some scholars that you'd be keen to hear about, please send me an email or drop us a note. Uh, next week, we'll have Deanna Womack from Emory University. Uh, her first book was a study of uh, Syrian Protestants in the 19th century, and especially the formation of AUB and the role of women in them. Uh, and then she's just written, 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 written a new book on building Christian Muslim relations in America. So we look forward to hearing from Deanna next week. But thank you so much, Bashir, for joining us. And we hope that uh, we'll be able to talk again soon. And thank you uh, for the messages, everybody. Thank you very much for listening. All right. Thank yeah. you. Bye. See you, see you Josh. Bye.